All right, we're back with the 57 bus and we are beginning part four, the last part of the book, which is called Justice, where we learn more about the outcome of the event that caused Sasha to be burned badly and Richard now facing um, serious charges uh, awaiting his um, trial. So part four begins with the chapter binary. There are two kinds of people in the world, male and female, gay and straight, black and white, normal and weird, cis and trans. There are two kinds of people in the world, saints and sinners, victims and villains, cruel and kind, guilty and innocent. There are two kinds of people in the world, just two, just two, only two. Cruel and unusual. Jasmine had her eyes fixed on Richard as he was escorted into the courtroom. He was dressed in juvenile halls, gray sweatshirt and khaki pants, his hair cropped close. When his eyes landed on her face, she made the shape of a heart with her fingers and held it to her chest. He grinned, then he pulled his expression into a neutral mask. If he smiled, people might think he didn't have compassion for Sasha. They might say he was smirking. It was mid-January. Richard had been at Juvenile Hall for over two months. So far, not much had happened on his case, but today a judge would hear a, peti a petition Dubois had filed asking the judge to send Richard's case back to juvenile court. Proposition 21, the law allowing prosecutors to file charges against juveniles in adult court had been upheld by the California State Supreme Court way back in 2002. But three subsequent United States Supreme Court decisions had put strict limits on the sentences that juveniles can receive, eliminating death sentences and many sentences of life without the possibility of parole, sometimes called LWOP. In each case, the High Court had decided the Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which bans cruel and unusual punishment. Richard hadn't killed anybody, so he wasn't facing the death penalty or life without the possibility of parole. If he received a life sentence, he'd be eligible to go before the parole board in seven years. But Dubois argued that the Supreme Court decisions about the death penalty and LWOP indicated evolving standards of decency that made it increasingly unacceptable to impose harsh sentences on young offenders. Proposition 21 enabled the DA, a criminal prosecutor by trade, to unilaterally decide at the outset of any proceedings that the 16-year-old defendant was irredeemably a depraved criminal offender who should be permanently deprived of the rehabilitative and parental reunification objectives and treatment originally provided to all juvenile offenders, he wrote. None of this made much of an impression on Judge Richard Cousins. He pointed out that Richard hadn't yet been tried, which made it too early to weigh in on the constitutionality of any sentence he might receive. And he added, this conduct is very egregious, and I don't think anybody would argue that if it were committed by an adult, that the punishment would be cruel and unusual. The petition was denied. In the hall outside the courtroom, Jasmine wept in her sister Juliet's arms. She rode the elevator down to the lobby with her eyes fastened on the floor. He's my baby, she said softly. All I can do is stand by him. Back at Juvie. The staff at Juvenile Hall remembered Richard from his previous stay there when he was 14 because before he went was sent to the group home. He'd been a pain in the butt then, the kind of kid who kept asking for things, and if he didn't get what he wanted, he'd ask someone else. He took up a lot of time, but they would liked him anyway. He was never a bad kid, one staffer explained. He's just a needy kid. He seemed different now. The goofy antic quality was gone. These days, Richard's wa Richard was serious, withdrawn. The boys who knew him before said he'd gotten boring. He didn't care about getting laughs. There, there were just 90 or 100 kids in all of Juvenile Hall, most of them boys, even though the facility had been built for 360. Now, with juvenile incarceration rates sinking, only half of the 12 30-bed units were open, and each of those were only half full. 
Richard knew the juvenile hall routine already. Before you leave your room in the morning, fold up your pajamas and blankets and leave them in a neat pile on the bed, what they called open air style. Step outside, put your shoes on, and then stand in front of your cell with your hands clasped behind your back to await instructions. Breakfast is in the common area at one of the round tables with checkerboard patterns in the center. School is a few yards away in two classrooms next to the common area. Those classrooms were the most colorful part of the unit. The walls colored, covered with posters, word lists, number lines, a visual vacation from the drab sameness of the rest of the unit. Richard found it was easier to concentrate there than it had been at school, even with the chaos of the living unit occasionally erupting outside the classroom door. He steadily moved through his coursework, earning de decent grades for the first time in his high school career. On Sundays, he went to services, which were held inside one of the classrooms. He liked studying the Bible, particularly the story of Job. In the story, God tests Job's faith by killing his wife and his children and his servants, destroying his house, his animals, and all his possessions. He makes Job's skin erupt in boils. Eventually, Job is reduced to nothing but raw suffering. How is this fair, Job asks. What kind of God does this to people? At the end of the story, God comes to Job in a whirlwind to answer his questions with, quest his, with questions of his own. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? He asks. He asks Job if he was there when the earth was made. If he knows where light and darkness dwell, if he can find a unicorn and make him plow the field, do you have an arm like God's and can your voice thunder like this? Okay, Job says, I see your point. God's knowledge and power are so vast, there's no point in questioning his choices. For Richard, the story was a comfort. Early on in his stay, Richard found himself sharing a 15-person living unit with the kid who had robbed him at gunpoint, the one he had thought of as a friend. The boy apologized for robbing him. Richard told Jasmine that he had accepted the apology because he knew what it was like to have wronged somebody else. He too hoped to be forgiven. Forgive, but don't forget, Jasmine liked to say. But now Richard told her to stop saying that. To forgive, you have to forget, he counseled, because otherwise you haven't truly forgiven. What if? Jasmine tried to stay focused on the positive. Richard was going to learn from this experience. She was sure. We're all going to learn something from this, she said frequently. But once after saying it, she shook her head. I wish it hadn't gone this far and he could have learned a different way, she said. I wish that the courts would give him a suitable punishment so that he can learn from this instead of just being institutionalized. Sometimes her mind couldn't help flickering through an ever-changing list of what ifs. What if she'd been able to afford to pay a lawyer to defend Richard when he was 14 instead of letting him be represented by the public defender? What if she'd gotten him tested for ADHD when he was a freshman like she thought about doing? What if she'd been able to find a place to live outside of Oakland where there weren't so many bad influences? What if he'd had more activities in his life, more things to keep him out of trouble? What if she'd taken him to sign up for an after-school jobs program like he'd been asking? What if Richard had called her when he was first arrested instead of talking to the police? What if she'd gone down to the police station when she first saw him on the news? She should have gone down there instead of calling. She shouldn't have just taken their word for it when they told her they didn't know anything. She should have, but then she'd stop herself. There had to be a reason why all of this was turning out the way it had. God works in mysterious ways, she said. He don't do anything on accident. Everything he do, he know exactly what he's doing. Not ready. Christmas came and went. School started again. Sasha was accepted into MIT. By February, life had slipped back toward normality, a new normal in which Sasha's legs were bound in white compression stockings 23 hours a day to prevent the development of thick scars at the site of the skin, skin grafts. The compression stockings were more 
more comfortable than the bandages had been, and Sasha's atrophied leg muscles had regained their strength. Jasmine wanted to meet with Sasha's family. She'd been thinking about it since Richard was first arrested. She wanted to tell them how sorry she was, mother to mother, parent to parent. I can imagine if it was my baby, she said. He didn't do anything for that to be done to him. But when Debbie heard the idea, she flinched. She thought about Jasmine often, she said, and she believed in forgiveness, but it was just too soon. She needed more time. What to say? Richard's first evidentiary hearing was in March. Sasha took the day off from school and came to court with Carl and Debbie. Dressed in a navy blue skirt, a gray vest, a brown striped bow tie, a gray flat cap, a trench coat, purple leggings, and purple high tops. They carried a book about the history of American socialism. Jasmine stared at Sasha, whom she was seeing in person for the first time. Emotions swirled inside her, sorrow and compassion, confusion and shame, emptiness. The hearing was over in minutes. Richard was held to answer, which meant that there was enough evidence against him for a judge to set a trial date. As Sasha's family filed out of the courtroom, Jasmine dashed over to speak to them. My son's not like that, she said, the words tumbling out of her mouth in a rush. I don't know what made him do that, and I'm sorry. We're not hateful people. Then she hugged each member of the family, Debbie, Carl, Sasha. One by one, each of Richard's relatives came forward to do the same. When it was over, both mothers were crying. Jasmine kept talking about Sasha. He just looks so innocent, she said. He just, he's just so cute. He has such a nice family. It's just not something I can get used to. There was so much more she had wanted to say, but she couldn't find the words. I don't know what to say, but sorry. Always okay. In the elevator, Debbie wiped away tears. I felt like it was genuine on their, their part, she said. It was good. I'm really glad. It was worth coming here today just for that. When asked how it felt to be hugged by the family of the person who had set them on fire, Sasha just smiled. I'm always okay with hugs, they said. Afterward, Carl, Debbie, and Sasha rode the courthouse elevator to the ninth floor to meet with Armando Parstran, Pastran, the deputy district attorney who was prosecuting the case. Pastran had seen the two families embrace, but he seemed unmoved. I'm glad that they showed some remorse, he said of Richard's family. I'd like to see some from the person who did it. Pastran had never spoken to Richard, of course. That's not how the system works. And Richard's letters were still tucked away in his lawyer's briefcase. We the people. A year after Sasha first posted their non-binary gender position, petition, another petition went up on We the People website. The wording was pretty much identical to the one Sasha had written. This time the petition went viral, viral, attracting attention from Reddit, Bustle, The Advocate, and Huffington Post. It earned 103,202 signatures and an official White House response, which said in part, we know how important the issue is, and we understand the profound impact, both symbolic and otherwise, of having official documents that accurately reflect an individual's identity. We cannot overstate the care and seriousness that should be brought to bear on the issue. That didn't mean the White House was planning to change federal policy. The official statement said that proposals to change the way gender is listed on government documents should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis by the affected federal and state agencies. Still, Sasha felt proud. The government had acknowledged the existence of non-binary gender. Who would have thought it possible? Pretty. Michael's girlfriend, Taya, stood behind Sasha, yanking at the laces of a scarlet corset. I wonder if I keep pulling, if Sasha will just disappear into negative space, she mused. It was April. She and Michael and Sasha and Nemo were getting ready for the Gaskell Ball, a Victorian gathering held in downtown Oakland at the Scottish Rite Center, an ornate 1920s era building on the shores of Lake Merritt. Taya's mother, Alisa Foster, is a costume designer. 
She had made Sasha a ball gown as a gift using fabric donated by the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, a San Francisco charity and street performance group that calls itself a leading edge order of queer nuns. The dress had a 23 inch waist. Taya, whose own gown was olive green and trimmed with gold ruffles, measured Sasha's waist, just under 25 inches. She yanked harder at the corset strings. Sasha, how are you even alive currently? Michael asked. He was wearing a gray vest and pants and a burgundy bow tie. Magic, Sasha grinned. They tapped their own collarbones. My lungs are up here. The human body is a wondrous thing. Feel a little bit guilty. I'm suffocating you, Taya said, pulling the corset tighter. It's consensual, Sasha said. Anyway, I don't think that's suffocation. Suffocation is when you put a pillow over someone's mouth and nose. Just then, Nemo walked in wearing an Edwardian west waistcoat, pleated pa black pants, a starched white shirt, and a pattern in blue and gray. They had pulled their straight brown hair into a ponytail at the nape of their neck. The curves are a good look for you, Nemo deadpanned, taking in Sasha's hourglass shape. Nemo sat down on the couch beside Taya and Michael and watched as Taya's mother helped Sasha into a royal blue ball gown with a scooped neck and a leg of mutton sleeves. A matching blue headpiece rested in Sasha's hair, a silk rosette over each ear. I feel pretty, Sasha announced, twirling in front of the mirror. You're so beautiful, Nemo said, conducting Sasha in a brief waltz around the room. Oh my goodness. Sasha was too tightly bound by the corset to put on shoes, so Nemo sat on the floor to do it for them. Mitzi, Taya's small black dog, sniffed at the hem of Sasha's dress. Dog, Sasha said irritably, I'm dry clean only. Your dry clean only, Nemo inquired, or your dress? Well, I effectively am my dress, Sasha observed on the outside. Are you? Nemo asked, interested by the statement. But you're also your skin and your necklace. Sasha shrugged. The parts of me that are accessible to the dog are dry clean only. Dancing. They entered together hand in hand, forearm to forearm. The ballroom's wooden floor gleamed under their feet. The revelers promenaded in pairs, women in bustled ball gowns in bright candy colors, men in frock coats with waxed mustaches. The outfits were a mashup of eras and styles, long gloves and short ones, feathers and jewels, flapper dresses, mini skirts, suits, jeans, and at least one man in a kilt with a raccoon pelt pouch at his waist. This is it, Sasha thought. I'm here in my ball gown with my partner and it's wonderful. It was wonderful because the dress was pretty and Sasha was pretty and the room was pretty and Nemo was pretty. It was wonderful because Sasha loved ballroom dancing and it was wonderful because for that night at least, nobody was going to mistake Sasha for a boy. All evening, men asked Sasha to dance. What I want is for people to be confused about what gender I am, Sasha explained later. That didn't happen too often. People tended to see Sasha as male, so it was not a nice change to be seen as female. On the stage, a brass band struck up an oompa, oompa, pa, oompa, pa waltz. Sasha and Nemo danced. Ripples. Darius Young worked as an organizer for an Oakland social justice advocacy group called the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights. He had been hired while still on probation after doing time, and he was passionate about keeping young people out of prison. I did 17 years, two days, four hours, and 20 minutes on a 20-year sentence as a third striker, he explained in an interview posted on the Ella Baker Center's website. I saw a lot of things that were wrong with the system, especially as I started to see the years go by. The people that were coming in were getting younger and younger, and I was like, there's something wrong with this. Why are we sending kids to prison for things that maybe they should have gotten corrected in their lives? And then I saw a pattern that most of them had started out in the juvenile justice system, which led me let me know that somewhere down the line it was failing. Darris had followed Richard's case in the news. When he saw Sasha's family on TV saying that they wanted Richard to be charged as a juvenile, 
he felt there was a chance that maybe a different kind of solution could be reached, one that didn't involve sending Richard to prison. Here was a case where so many people thought, okay, yeah, it's a horrific thing that happened, but yet here's a young man that seemed to be salvageable. He didn't have a long criminal record or anything like that, he said, especially because the victim's family, they were so forgiving. It seemed like they just wanted to put this behind them without causing any more harm to the community at large. Because, you know, whenever anyone goes to prison, it harms the whole community. It has ripple effects up and down. Darris and another organizer, Maria Dominguez, contacted Jasmine to see if she might be interested in something called restorative justice. Jasmine wasn't interested at first. She'd never heard of restorative justice and she was already feeling overwhelmed. But eventually she agreed to meet with them to learn more. They couldn't promise anything. All the parties would have to agree, including Sasha's family, the district attorney and Richard's defense lawyer, Bill Dubois. But they knew that a restorative justice advocate named Anna Blackshaw had been in touch with Sasha's family. And so they thought it might be possible to bring the two sides together to keep Richard out of prison. Once you send an 18 year old to state prison, there are older individuals there and they are very influential, Darris explained. Most of the time, individuals don't come out of prison better. Smack. One day in the fall of 2015, two ninth grade students sat in biology class at Oakland High School watching a substitute teacher try in vain to control the classroom. The two could not have been more unlike each other. TC was soft-spoken, slight, and of Vietnamese descent. She dressed like most Oakland High students in a hoodie and sweats, but she wore her long black hair in two girlish braids. Jeff was a rambunctious African-American boy with a blood streak in his, a blood streak, blonde streak in his close cropped hair. The kind of kid who talks nonstop, unleashing a stream of comic commentary that's half hilarious, half annoying. The kind of kid who, when the girl at the desk next to him doesn't want to show him her binder, slaps her hard on the behind. The smack caught TC entirely by surprise. It hurt and it was humiliating. Nobody had ever touched her butt before. Furious, she picked up a chair ready to hurl it at Jeff. The classroom erupted into commentary and instructions. Put it down, a classmate urged. If you don't know anything about it, you need to shut up, TC shouted, her eyes filling with tears, but she put the chair down. The event stayed with her all day. That afternoon, she told some of her friends what had happened and began to cry. You need to report him, they urged, so she did. When Oakland High School administration began to investigate, they found that in the preceding couple of days, Jeff had slapped or grabbed the butts of two other ninth grade girls as well. Sexual harassment is grounds for suspension or expulsion, but keeping students from going to school is usually counterproductive and super suspensions have been shown to disproportionately target African-American males. For that reason, many Oakland schools have been exploring a different approach to school discipline restorative justice. Given a choice between traditional discipline, which would probably have meant Saturday school and participating in a restorative justice circle with the three kids he girls he touched, Jeff chose restorative justice. Still, he went into the process annoyed. He'd just been playing around. Why was everybody making a big deal about it? It was like, I'm gonna go in there with a bunch of females and talk about something that's a week old, Jeff said later. Two of the girls, Jay and Pancha, had similar feelings. They'd been mad at the time, but whatever. It was history now. I wasn't really traumatized about it, Pancha said. Schools are all about rules. There are rules against sexual harassment and those rules spell out what kinds of conduct is prohibited and what the punishment should be. Restorative justice, on the other hand, is more interested in relationships. A crime, RJ, a crime, RJ advocates say, is not an act against a rule, it's an act against a person. When you harm somebody, you owe it to them to make things right. By making things right, 
you begin to heal your relationship with the community. Our system is focused on blame and punishment and not on healing and learning, says Lauren Abramson, who founded the Community Conferencing Center in Baltimore, Maryland, one of the oldest and most widely widely respected RJ programs in the nation. There's a different way to deliver justice that's been proven in many cases to be more socially effective and more cost effective. The Oakland High Circle started out silly. Nobody except TC and the two adult facilitators could stop joking around. But when the three girls started to talk about their feelings about being touched, things suddenly got serious. Nobody minded playing around, the girls said, but in this case, Jeff had crossed the line. In the end, the four students made an agreement to ask permission before touching each other, even in play. And then the whole thing was done, over. More than over, actually. Now the four were friends. We all bonded from this experience, Jay explained as the four of them shared a bag of cashews a month later. It helped us get the feelings we had out and we trust each other. It was a good way to get the event just out of our heads. And of course, asking for permission had become a running joke. Can I touch you? Pancha asked, helping herself to the bag of cashews. The other snorted. With it, without the circle, they said, the whole thing would have blown over, but the residue would have remained. I think it would still have been kind of weird if we didn't do the restorative justice circle, TC said, at least for me. Yeah, Jay said, because whenever you'd see that person, it would just be like, he's the one who smacked my butt, Jeff finished. He and Pancha acted out, running into each other in the grocery store sometime in the distant future. Hey, I'm Jeff from high school. You're the one who smacked my butt. I'm the one who smacked your butt, they cracked up. Jeff stuffed a handful of nuts into his mouth. Would you please close your mouth when you eat, Poncha said, making a face. Jeff shook his head solemnly. We're going to need another restorative justice circle. Then he grinned. We ain't never used to talk like this, he said. I feel like I can tell them more now. I can trust these three. That was the thing about restorative justice. It allowed you to hold two things in your head at the same time. The butt slapping was funny and also that it wasn't that asking permission to touch someone was funny, but that you really didn't want to be touched by somebody who didn't ask. That the girls wanted Jeff to dial back the butt smacking thing, but that they still liked joking around with him. That the whole thing wasn't a big deal and that it kind of was. That was what community was. All those layers of understanding. Restorative justice. Sujatha so Baliga had been getting calls from community activists from the moment Richard was arrested. As one of the nation's foremost experts on restorative justice, she was the one people turned to in situations like this, situations where healing seemed possible. And so Sujatha was, had called a few people she knew in the Alameda County District's Attorney's Office to say that she was available to facilitate if the families were interested in initiating a restorative justice process. I don't cold call crime victims ever, she said. I'm not here to peddle restorative justice. Restorative justice is sometimes used in Alameda County as an alternative to criminal court for juveniles accused of felonies, a process known as diversion because the accused is diverted away from criminal court. When that happens, a local nonprofit facilitates a process called family group conferencing that includes the offender, the offender's family, and other important adults like teachers or pastors, as well as the victim and the victim's supporters and advocates. The structure is similar to the one involving Jeff, TC, Poncha, and Jay at Oakland High School. The members of the circle talk about what happened and then make a plan for how the harm can be repaired. When it's a criminal case, the plan contains measurable benchmarks. If the kid completes the plan and meets the benchmarks, no criminal charges are filed. A recent study of the Community Conferencing Center, one of the nation's oldest restorative justice programs in Baltimore, Maryland, found that those who took part in the process were 60% less likely to reoffend than those who went through the traditional legal process. RJ isn't a guarantee of leniency, 
Baliga cautioned. It's about dispensing with punitiveness for its own sake and trying to produce an outcome that will be more healing for everyone involved. Still, Baliga knew there was little hope of diverting Richard from the criminal justice system entirely. Given the severity of the harm to Sasha, we didn't expect that the DA would allow the case to be diverted to restorative justice, she said. But if anyone seemed right for restorative justice, it was these two families who had already expressed compassion for one another. They were perfect candidates for this dialogue, she said. All of them were such gorgeously enlightened, beautiful people. Not wanting to. Debbie and Carl didn't feel much need for restorative justice. The impromptu encounter with Jasmine had felt healing, but Debbie didn't have any desire for another meeting. I don't know what I would get out of meeting with Richard, she said. I'm kind of not wanting to do that. She was wary, too, about making any recommendation about what should happen to him other than he should be tried as a juvenile. I've never felt like I have enough information to know how to judge or think about this kid, she said. I don't want to be begging for lenience and then have him go out and hurt someone else, but I also don't want him to be sent to adult prison. Mostly, she just wanted to see the case wrapped up before Sasha left for college. The one thing she didn't want was for Sasha to have to fly back from Massachusetts in the middle of the term to testify at a trial. I don't want to go to trial, she said. I really don't. The People versus Richard. Richard's lawyer, Bill Dubois, thought the whole restorative justice discussion was a distraction. There was no way, he said, that the district attorney's office would go for it. Restorative justice has never been a consideration in this case, he said. I love their program, but I've already broached the subject. It's the farthest thing. It's an absurd suggestion. For their part, the district attorney's office said they had no objection to the families going through the restorative justice process if they wanted, but it wouldn't affect the amount of time Richard served. This was not a case where he was not going to be incarcerated, Alameda County DA Nancy O'Malley said. We could not ignore what he did. The truth was the legal system had its own unassailable logic, a logic that couldn't be shifted. Guilty versus innocent, prosecutor versus defense attorney, victim versus offender. Tired. Spring stretched into summer. One court appearance followed another. Each time Richard's case was called, all that happened was that the judge set another court date. Both sides were hoping for a plea bargain, but as time went on, Jasmine's shining optimism faded. She came to the courthouse looking grim and sat in the hallway with Maria Dominguez and Darris Young from the Ella Baker Center, waiting for Richard's case to be called. They were the people she trusted to explain to her what was going on. She was tired of talking about the case, tired of thinking about it. I work 12, sometimes 14 hours a day, and when I come home, I just want to go to sleep, she said. Hunched on a bench in the hallway, she looked like a guttering candle, its flame buffeted by the wind. The press didn't come to court anymore, but the ladies did. They never missed an appearance. Department 11. Please turn off cell phones and pagers before entering courtroom. No food, drinks, or gum chewing allowed on courtroom, in courtroom. No eating or talking or reading while court is in session. No talking or loitering in the vestibule. No communication with inmates. Department 11 is a way station, a courtroom you pass through on your way to someplace else. It's the court where cases are put on the calendar for their first hearings, where plea bargains are accepted and sentences passed down. No trials happen here. It's a clearinghouse. Crowded in the morning, nearly empty by lunch. Here, the in-custody defendants sit in the jury box waiting for their cases to be called. Their hands are cuffed and they wear color-coded jailhouse jumpers, jumpsuits. Yellow for maximum security, blue for minimum, and red for administrative segregation, which is the official term for solitary confinement. The lawyers file in and out of the courtroom, sauntering past the gate that separates the gallery from the court, ducking back into chambers to chat with the judge, making small talk with the bailiff or one and one another. They lean down to confer with their clients, go on and off the record, consult their calendars. 
In the gallery, friends and family members sit and watch the bewildered audience to a play performed in an unknown dialect of acronyms, Latin and Old English. Every once in a while, the bailiff barks at someone in the seats who has been talking while court was in session. If I have to warn you again, you're out of here and you're not going to be allowed back. Grown-ups flinch like misbehaving kids, guiltily lapping, lapsing into silence. When you spend some time in the courthouse, you start to recognize the people who didn't heed that first warning. They're the ones outside in the hallway, slumped on a bench, faces streaked with impotent tears. Maybe. It was August. Sasha was getting ready to leave for college. They were excited and a little nervous. The nerves mostly had to do with leaving the Bay Area bubble. Here, finding a bunch of queer people to be my friends isn't very hard, Sasha explained. Whereas at MIT, I'm going to have to work a little harder to seek out my people. The fire was becoming a more distant memory, even though Sasha still wore compression stockings. Apart from some scars, I'm all healed, basically, Sasha said. It was hard for people to believe it, but Sasha didn't feel traumatized by what had happened. When the physical pain faded, the emotional pain did as well. I don't really feel hated, Sasha explained, especially since after I was attacked, the whole world was supporting me. I feel like one person hates me, maybe. Suitcase. Sasha packed for college. They brought all the usual things, bed sheets and shower shoes, clothes hangers and alarm clock. They packed a ukulele too and a packet of subway maps. For clothes, they took button up shirts, t-shirts, leg warmers and all the skirts they owned. Two pairs of Converse sneakers, one pair of ballet flats and of course hats, seven of them, including a knit cap, a flat cap, a Russian Ushaka hat and a Chairman Mao hat with a red star at the forehead. A few key books came along as well, a vegan cookbook, the novel Trains and Lovers by Alexander McCall Smith, The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin, a book about anarchism called Black Flame, and the novel Orlando by Virginia Woolf about a poet who changes gender from male to female. Only two souvenirs from the fire traveled with Sasha to MIT. One was the compression garments. The other was the string of paper cranes that had been made by the students at Oakland High School. A prayer. As she got ready for her only child to leave home, Debbie thought about the psychologist who had first diagnosed Sasha with Asperger's syndrome. The psychologist said he'd seen many children with autism over the years and none of them had ever married. He had advised Debbie and Carl to lower their expectations for the future. With a little luck and some hard work, he predicted, Sasha might be able to hold down a low-level job doing data processing. At the time, Sasha was seven years old. Debbie and Carl had chosen not to work with that particular psychologist, and now, more than a decade later, Debbie couldn't help gloating a little. Take that, Mr. Doom and Gloom Therapist, she wrote on her blog in a pair of posts celebrating Sasha's high school graduation. Now Sasha is off to MIT. MIT! This dreamer, this creator of imaginary languages and a whole world in which to speak it. This sweet, funny, sometimes annoying, sometimes brilliant, naive child of mine. This child, who is now an adult and about to launch like a rocket blazing in beauty through the night sky to worlds unknown. May the blaze and blast be glorious and the universe welcoming. And may Sasha feel all of our love like a glowing halo around them. <laughs>